and welcome back to Calculus 1, section 4.6 on Mean Value Theorem. Apparently, stream is uh, up and running, which is great, thank you. So, um, as I said, if the stream cuts out at any point, um, all you need to do is to type in 4.6 or whatever. The, you don't even have to type the title, just 4.6, 4.7, whatever, and you will find it on, uh, on YouTube because I have multiple sets of these uh, online. Anyway, the um, uh, lecture is on mean value theorem, and we are going to uh, see that at some instances, the average value of the function, which is slope of the secant line, and, uh, in uh, and the uh, instantaneous value, there we go, which is the derivative uh, and slope of the tangent line, are the same at some instances. Now, uh, when you are driving, uh, you can calculate your average velocity, your average speed, by taking the total distance covered and divide that by the total time it took you to, to go there. So, for instance, if you drive from here to New York, it's 60 miles, and you do the whole thing in one hour, 60 divided by 1 is 60 miles per hour. And that would be your average speed. But you know what? I am going to bet at least once there was a stop sign or a red light on that journey where you hopefully stopped, right? So I know that your speed wasn't always 60. I also know that on 78, the speed limit is 65, so you drive 80. And uh, right, so to, to get the average speed out of the, um, the uh, thing, it's total distance divided by total time. Now, if you are looking at your speedometer, which changes instantly as you uh, work on acceleration or deceleration, which is both ac acceleration, positive and negative, which are your gas pedal and your brake, um, you are changing the velocity, right? And uh, that instantaneous velocity is the one that is uh, your uh, speed at the instant, speed at the moment, and that's the speed uh, for which you get ticketed if you get pulled over. Now, let's take a look at uh, this uh, diagram. Uh, these are my uh, superb drawing skills. We have a highway over here. With, let's just put two lanes for simplicity. We are going to put a car on the road right going forward this way i make sure some tires are poking out right there we go so that would be the car uh going the posted speed limit uh over here is for simplicity let's say 60 miles per hour so that would be the speed limit now what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, put some shrubbery over here because we need coverage and we put more shrubbery over here so these are this would be, the, you know, just shrubbery. You know what shrubbery is. Uh, we are going to put our speed trap over here. There is the speed trap number one with red and blue. Hold on. There we go. Perfect. And uh, uh, this particular squad car is going to use a very inefficient X-band. Uh, X-band is very wide, uh, wide, very easy to detect with... Uh, even like wow, 50 bucks radar detector will, will get that one, which is this car is equipped with a state-of-the-art uh, radar detector, as you are going to see soon. But here's the second one, right? Uh, let's say uh, five miles out. Uh, there is uh, another speed trap over here for uh, uh, the same thing. Now, this one is... Uh, clearly not the same manufacturer for those emergency lights because the one has the right left side blue and the other one has the right side blue, but that's okay. Um, what we are uh, interested at is uh, this instance when you are measured as you are passing through these uh, speed traps. Now, uh, there are some specs for these speed traps. First of all, you know that the speed limit is 60, and believe me, these cops are going to give you, because by law they should give you the ticket even if you are one uh, mile per hour over the speed limit. So even one over uh, should uh, be issuing the ticket. Now, as I said, the car is uh, equipped with a state-of-the-art $450 
uh, Cobra radar detector, which is uh, working on 16 bands and uh, can detect technically anything, uh, including the, the nuclear submarines. So the, not that you would have one, this is all land over here, but just saying in a distance, it, it picks it up. So um, you have this thing, I should have gone with F-117, the invisible airplanes. Little puddle with the telescope. Oh, okay, I see. All right, fine. <laughs> so here, I'll add some. I'll add some br br branches and things, so it's no longer uh, branches, right? These branches poking out, it's dry. All right. So now, uh, this is what happens. You are driving your speed, 80, 90, 170, whatever, and then uh, your radar detector goes off, right? Um, you know there's a speed trap, you're slowing down, you're passing through the first speed trap at 60 miles per hour, you are not getting pulled over, right? And uh, this is happening, let's say, at 1.06 p.m., right? You are rushing to your class, which started at 12.30. Um, the uh, five miles down the road, right? So you pass the first speed trap, right? The, 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 the squad car is in your rear view mirror. You are back to driving 170. And um, um, the radar detector goes off again, right? And uh, you are back down to 60 miles per hour. And uh, it is 1.09 p.m. And you drive off. You are not pulled over at all because your uh, your uh, speed is uh, 60 miles per hour clocked and um, uh, you didn't do anything wrong at the moment when your speed was measured, right? Well, you go to class, you spend the remaining 15 minutes in class, and then you go back home, right? Two, three days later, in the mail, there is a ticket. Now, I always do this. Who experienced such a thing that you just open up an envelope and you find a speeding ticket in it? Uh, so no one is admitting to it. Generally, in every classroom, I have one or two students. So now it's just no one admitting? Ah, oh, fine. That's, that's okay. Fine. So, um, so what's, what's happening here? Right? Um, you see, when you look at these two instantaneous speeds, uh, you are not getting ticketed for them because you were not breaking the law. You were driving 60 miles per hour through both speed traps, right? However, if you calculate your average speed, so velocity average, you went five miles in three minutes. Five miles in three minutes, right? Now, if you are to convert this, you have 5 divided by 3 times, and the conversion factor from minutes to hours is very good, 1 over 60, right? So now, you have 5 divided by 1 over 20, right, which is 100 miles per hour. Your average speed is 100 miles per hour, even though you went through both speed traps at 60. The average speed only takes in consideration the distance covered, and between the two squad cars, there was 5 miles. That is something you can't change. And also what you can't do yet is change the time from 106 to 109 to change it to whatever else, right? So what is happening here? Well, your average speed was 100. Now, no one pulled you over, no one stopped you, no one wrote you a ticket and told you you shouldn't be driving um, uh, that fast. So how's there a ticket? Well, it's the mean value theorem. By mean value theorem, uh, it says that if the path function is continuous, and you definitely didn't teleport yet. Uh, so if the function is continuous and the function is differentiable, well, this is all smooth curves, right? Um, the instantaneous uh, velocity 
uh, and uh, average velocity will be the same in at least one point. And that's what guarantees that you're... Now, if you, if you think about this, guys, uh, if you have a scale, and here is, here is 60, and here is 100, which is average, and you know that you were driving 60 at one point in time, and then driving 60 again at some other point in time, and the average was 100. Wouldn't the common sense tell you that you had to peak way over that 100, right, to make the average be 100? You see that? So this is when I, when I make the joke, you go back driving, like figure of speech, 170, right? I don't know, but yeah, right? So the more, the longer you hang out in the slow area, right, the higher the peak is going to be uh, on, the, on the speeding side. So it is clear that you were driving 100, from this diagram, it is clear that you were driving 100 miles per hour at least twice. I'm not saying that there wasn't maybe a third trap or there was an animal on a road that you detected and then you actually, right, because if you're driving like 160 and you see an animal, yeah, right? But it, this could be the case, okay? And then you went four times, right? Or this could be the case and you went three times, you know, driving 100. But what's guaranteed is that at least once, you were driving 100 and they can ticket you for that. How do you implement this? Do you need squad cars and someone sitting in it? No. Easy pass gates. Easy pass gates are on a certain interval. And at the speed limit that it's proposed, which is actually what's being done, at a certain speed limit that is proposed between two easy, uh, two easy pass gates, you have 10 miles, let's say. If your time is bigger than X, whatever it's supposed to be due to speed limit, ticket, right? And that's the reason why a lot of people, uh, well, a lot of people, generally one student or two students per calculus one class, say, oh yeah, I did get a ticket. Right? Because that's exactly what happened, especially at the time when they were piloting this. Now, clearly, there are ways to counter it. You have two accounts, or you have the uh, um, autonomous car that just drives, and you, you're passed out. You have no clue what happened because the car was uh, taking care of and driving the speed limit. So, um, so yeah. But uh, it is something that has been researched and, and, and piloted a lot. And um, whether it's implemented in its full or not, I don't know, but uh, it is very easy to, to keep the track of something like that because, you know, all the easy pass customers are already, right? Now, clearly, um, that would hurt the, the business, right? So a lot of these things are hush-hush are or they will be completely separate type of gates uh, that are made. Uh, I'm not sure if you know that the Department of Transportation has uh, highway cameras. Uh, if you go to the, to the website, you can actually take a look at the highway uh, I did this 10 years ago when I had to commute to NGIT. Uh, if I had to drive there about two hours before, because it takes me about 40 minutes to get to NGIT. If there is traffic, it could be infinite. So uh, the, the worst one was 3.15, three hours, 15 minutes for me. So what I do, two hours before I have to leave for, for school, uh, every day, two hours prior, I would just check all of the... Uh, traffic cameras that are publicly available on the website on the 78 and I would see that the cars are just zooming. If I see the long line of cars, A, train, B, leave immediately, you have two hours, you might make it, right? So that was uh, something. So you can find this, uh, these cameras if you, if you Google and every highway has it. So now, what's the big deal with, along with those cameras, put an extra device, right, that will, that will do this, right, and uh, create the revenue. It works for the state. Cops are not in danger approaching every car they have to pull over, right? So from the standpoint of state and the law, it's a win-win for them, right? Um, they're getting a lot of 
revenue and the cops are not in danger pretty much at all because all you're doing is you're mailing the, mailing the tickets. So there you, there you go. Anyway, um, what is the theorem that guarantees such, such a thing? So what we've seen from this example is that the average velocity that is computed by dividing the total distance by the total time uh, is giving us what the average speed is. And then using the mean value theorem, we are able to claim that the instantaneous speed, so the speed that you get ticketed for, the one that is on your speedometer uh, at every instant, is the same at least once. In this case, I showed you at least twice. Well, the theorem goes like this. So here's a theorem. And this is obviously a big theorem in mathematics because it deals with a lot more than what I said. This is just one application of it. But it, later in mathematics has much bigger applications in other things. So if a function f of x is continuous on closed interval a, b and differentiable on uh, open interval a, b, uh, then there is at least one point C in that interval, open interval a, b, such that, and the statement is, the average, which is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, is equal to f prime at that c. Now, technically, what the left-hand sa side says is the slope of the secant line, and the right-hand says slope of the tangent line. That looks like a fam. Tangent line. There we go. So I'm tangent. So this is the statement, and um, it is important to actually not just learn the formula, but also conditions. Uh, this formula doesn't apply uh, necessarily if one of the conditions is uh, violated. For instance, continuous. You can have a vertical asymptote. That means at one point your speed was infinity. Yeah, good luck with achieving that, right? We can't even achieve the speed of light, and that's a finite number. Imagine pushing that to infinity. Huh? Yeah, right? So there's that. And then uh, also um, not differentiable, right? If it's not differentiable, that you don't, you don't have the instantaneous velocity at all, right? The whole system falls apart. So both conditions are very, very important. And then, you know, depending on who's teaching the class, you might, you know, run into a troll question and uh, completely uh, do it wrong because A, function was either not continuous or B, not differentiable, right? So you have to know the both conditions and they should, they should make sense. So as I said, right, you, you cannot be um, going at infinite speed such as, okay, there's a vertical asymptote, right? It goes to infinity, so you, you can't have that. And um, uh, discontinuity of the path, right? You can't go from point A from point B at 60 miles per hour average if the bridge is out, I mean, these are common sense things when you try to think of mathematics in the applied setting and say, yeah, it applies to this particular case. And it does. I mean, bridges out, that's discontinuity. Done deal. So um, the problems are uh, uh, generally uh, we look for the value C. Uh, I would like to know for which C we have this situation. Now, before I go and uh, do any of the, the problems, maybe not, not put this line here yet, uh, I want to draw the diagram to show the... Um, uh, this, is, this is tough to draw, so I'll, I'll try. So my goal is to draw two parallel lines. There we go, got it. So, at this point is your A, at this point is your B, and then you have your 
f of a and your uh, f of b and here is the here is your c so a b c now simply saying that the two slopes are the same that means the two lines are parallel so two lines one secant line and one tangent line they are parallel because they have the same slope so um, that's the graphical component of what we are dealing with in this case so now I'm going to uh, say in general we are looking to compute C and I'm, I'm carefully saying the word compute because of that fav fav uh, that good old meme that was you know in algebra it's like this and then they say put uh, 3 5 and X and they say find X you've seen this and the student did this there it is right <laughs> and that was the answer so now you say oh, okay yeah well student is right <laughs> that's the correct answer he found an X uh, I was not specific enough which is compute calculate the value for X so just because of this meme right here I am going to uh, be more specific on actually your job is to compute C so you know figure out C is equal to 7 or, or 19 or something like that all right, so let's take a look at the problem. Um, we are going to do one of these problems that are uh, just no meaning to it. It's just shoveling mathematics. And then we'll, we'll do one applied problem to um, see that as well. Uh, what should we do? What is, what is nice and, and bad at the same time? Okay, let's let's do problem twenty. I know how much you love log. Stop discriminating. Holy nightmare, people. At least pretend you're nice. So we have f of x is equal to ln of two x on the interval one to e. So the claim is there is a c somewhere between one and e. Uh, e is about 2.7. So there is a number somewhere between 1 and 2.7 where the instantaneous and average value for this function are the same. At least one place, maybe more, but let's see. So what do I have? I have f of b minus f... Oh, first of all, conditions. Uh, we need to check the conditions. Uh, is ln differentiable? Yes, it is, right? You get 1 over x everywhere. And then, is, uh, is it continuous? Oh, yeah, it's a continuous function, right? So, so we're good. It's continuous, it's differentiable, so passes both conditions. Generally, I just put, you know, two green check marks, which means pass both conditions. And uh, Calc 2 is coming up, and certain things you will have to work out as conditions first. F prime at C on the other side. That's the derivative side. So what do I do? Well, I have f of b. That's going to be ln of 2e minus ln of 2 times 1 divided by e minus 1 is equal to the derivative. Now, I have to find derivative on the side because I'm supposed to plug in c for x. So when I find derivative on a side, I know it's supposed to put the function as is on the bottom, and it's derivative on top. These guys will cancel, so I actually just get 1 over x. Yay, right? So it's 1 over c over here. Because it's f prime of c. Your f prime of x has x in it. Your f prime of c has c in it. But they have to be the same function. So 1 over x becomes 1 over c. So now that I have... I have that. All I need to do is what's the only unknown variable here in this equation? It's C. So just solve for it, right? Uh, ln 2e, well, 
ln2 plus ln e minus ln2 over e minus 1 is 1 over c. See, what I did is instead of computing anything, I used the good old rules of logs to split the multiplication in the argument into addition of two logs. And now ln2 dies. Right? Because ln2 minus ln2 is 0. And ln e is 1. Thank you. Ln e is 1. So the whole thing that looked horrible is now 1 over e minus 1 is 1 over c. <coughs> now, if you know rules of fractions, you know that if you flip fraction on one side, you flip the fraction on the other side. So all I need to do is to say that c is equal to e minus 1 when I flip both sides. So about 1.7, okay, 1.72. So, we were charged with the task to find the point where the average is going to be equal to uh, instantaneous and the guarantee by the theorem, if the conditions are met, there is that uh, there will be at least one point like that. Well, we found it. Uh, this C is actually X value. So, if we are to compute uh, the slope of the secant line and, uh, and the slope of the tangent line, they will be the same value. They are not e minus 1. That's the x input value that you would use to compute. Right? And, uh, and there's that. So, about 1.7. And this problem is solved. So, one more time to recap the entire thing. There we go. Uh, we start with the function. Now, obviously, for the word problem, you have to come up with that if it's not given. And then the interval. We had in our problem that I did with the, with the speeding, I had interval of time, right? 106 to 109 is three minutes. So I had five miles divided by three minutes in my calculation in the applied problem. Over here, you have f of b. Well, f of b, that's ln2e, minus f of a, which is 2 times 1, and then you compute, 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 and there goes the c at the end. So you have to be very careful. Now, I am not going to solve this problem. I'm just going to point out um, the restricted domain is a very important thing to observe because... Um, you are going to run into functions that are clearly not continuous and clearly not differentiable, but we don't care because those uh, uh, issues are not happening at the domain that is proposed to us. So just keep in mind that f of x as x plus 1 over x has a vertical asymptote at 0, i.e. not continuous and not differentiable at that point, right? It's a vertical asymptote. Right? It's the worst you can do. But then, uh, they give us this. 1 to 3. And all of a sudden, you don't care. Because 1 to 3 does not include 0. And at this interval, 1 to 3, this function is perfectly smooth, continuous, differentiable, has all of the perks, and it's nice. All right? So you have to be careful about that. If you see a discontinuous function, just make sure that discontinuity is not the part of this. Now, clearly, right, so I'm, I'm going to put the green check marks here because uh, on this interval, both conditions pass. Now, I should put if. Now, if the interval is, let's say, negative 1 to 1, oh, no, no, no. Right? In this case, we are going to place two red X's. The conditions do not pass, and I cannot do intermediate value theorem. Uh, sorry, mean value theorem to... I can't do the other one. To do this problem. Let's take a look at one more word problem and call it quits. Believe it or not, this is it. I hope you're not disappointed. It's, um, that's the life of mean value theorem. Oh, by the way, the me word mean is not evil. It's the, like the mid value. All right, good. I'll put that out there. 
I love these titles for the problems. Problem 33 says mean value theorem and the police. <laughs> and then uh, problem 34, mean value theorem and the police again. <laughs> and then we go with the 35 running pace. Okay, let's, uh, we can talk about running, pa running pace. We, we had the police already in our lives today in a problem. Anyone pulled over? No? Okay, good. You made it. Uh, running pace. Explain why if a runner completes a 6.2 mile run, this is 35, 6.2 mile run in 32 minutes, <laughs> so slow, It takes me about four and a half minutes to cover this distance. He's doing like 32. Like, I can be there eight times over. <laughs> I know, right? When I see a runner alongside of the road, I stop. And I ask them if they need a ride, because obviously <laughs> they're in a rush. They have no car. Right? So, I, I don't know, I want to be a nice person. Generally, if it's a female, they just run off into the, right, off the road and the thing, and I'm thinking, well, the forest is not a place where you should be running. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. Then I quit because no one ever took the offer. So I said, fine. Like, I labeled the whole population as just, of people who are running next to the road as non-cooperative, non-interesting. I just pass by. I wish them well, though. Yes. So explain why if a runner completes 6.2 mile uh, race in 32 minutes, um, then he must have been running at exactly 11 miles per hour at least twice in the race. Uh, this problem just assumed the gender, if you didn't notice. Explain why if a runner completes, right, we're all neutral up to here, and then, then he must be running at exactly, we all know that females are faster, so. Anyway. Oh no, that's why it's 32 minutes. Okay, I got it now. All right, fine. So uh, explain why he must have been running exactly 11 miles per hour at least twice. Well, I just did this problem with the, the, the same diagram. So, why 11 miles per hour at least twice? Okay, so, well, I have the total distance, which is 6.2 miles, divided by uh, 32 minutes. Well, we want it in hours, so it's 32 minutes times... The one hour has 60 minutes, so that goes there. And we have the double fraction of 6.2 divided by 1 divided by 32 divided by 60. Now, when you solve the double fraction, you have 6.2 times 60 divided by 32. And uh, then you take the abacus and you figure these things. I mean, you can cancel. This cancels roughly at, by 2 and so on so you're expecting to get about 12.5 ish or whatever it is but let's see the decimals because i know how obsessed you are with that um 6.2 times 60 divided by 32 is 11625 11.63 great right uh, they're asking for 11 miles per hour. So, guys, what's happening on a diagram? The runners, right, they're generally in a crouch position, like the, you know. And then the shot is fired. Whoever survives runs, or they run because of the shot. I don't know how that goes, but apparently there is that. So, the runner is starting with a zero velocity. And uh, increases, 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 runs, 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 he comes there and then goes back and stops because the race is over. Now, the 
high values over here, see the 11 mark is there. You see that you would say, well, wh why is that line so high up if it's average? Well, you have to understand that this is a constant speed and this is building up from zero, so there is much less, right? So shorter time, but technically zero speed or one mile per hour, two mile per hour, right? Going over there also to stop on the other side. So yeah, it's gonna be high. And um, you see that at 11 miles per hour, it cuts it twice. Now that doesn't mean that the, the runner didn't you know, do that because tired or whatever, or seen something interesting on the side of the road. Um, that could happen, but it's guaranteed at least twice because it went over 11 miles per hour at some point and then had to come back because the speed was zero to begin and zero to stop. The same thing like you with the car, right? You unlock the car while car is parked and then you sit in it, right? You don't jump through the window into the car while car is already going 60 miles per hour and then just abandon the car on the parking lot while car is like <laughs> drifting away, you jump out, right? No, you put the car back to stop, right? You park and the velocity is zero. So you're guaranteed to have those two zeros on ends. And then obviously the line has to cross at least twice. Well, that's that. Uh, that's the uh, mean value theorem that connects the average and instantaneous uh, values. And uh, you have uh, homework on it, so practice it and bring the questions if you have. When we come back, uh, 4.7. You did the class prep for 4.7? So some of you know it's Hellner. Good. Not all. All right.